Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to part six of our video series in which we scratch build a highly modified Supro 6422 Tremel Verb. In this chapter of our saga, we're going to construct the wooden cabinet and we're going to machine the steel chassis. Since I have already posted a video showing step-by-step -step how to build a finger-jointed cabinet, I'm going to post a link to that video for those who want to see every single step and detail of the process. For those of you who simply want to see the progress in the Supro amp build, just stay tuned and uh, we'll check out the finished wooden cabinet and then we'll machine the chassis. Just to show you how some things never change, here we are with the Supro materials uh, and Rusty's sniffing them for us. Okay, I got a new saw blade for some nice sharp clean cuts in the box joints. Uh, some T-nuts to hold the uh, speaker to the baffle. Uh, two four foot uh, one by twelves. A nice furring strip and a sheet of one inch or I'm sorry, one half inch thick, really nice clean straight plywood for the baffle and back panels. And also the tight bond premium two glue to put it all together. Rusty and I are out in the workshop working on the Supro amp cabinet and uh, a big rainstorm has come up. And this is rather unusual out here in the desert uh, and they're usually rather exciting so I thought I would record just a little of it. I'm going to try a different method to cut the 10 and 3 quarter inch hole in the speaker baffle. Uh, I'm going to use my router rather than the saber saw as I've used in the past. And I really don't like saber saws. They just bounce all around and fight you every inch of the way. So what I've done is uh, I've cut a hole right here at the perimeter of the circle. I have put in a little straight sided uh, router bit and then I I drilled through the center of the circle and through my router table and then pinned it with a number 10 bolt so that the wood is going to revolve in a perfect circle hopefully while the bit cuts a nice smooth cut around this curve. We'll see. Well it works perfectly. Let me show you a little bit of it here. And as you can see, it's cutting an absolutely perfect circle around here just effortlessly. And I'm not wrestling with a scary router that's going to disembowel me if I make the slightest mistake. It's all bolted down. Nothing can go anywhere except the center out of the hole. Well, this works so well, it's almost scary. Look at this. It's a perfect circle. Uh, no irregularities like you get with a saber saw. And uh, all in about a minute and totally safe. I'll tell you, I am a convert. No more saber saw holes for me. And a really neat wooden frisbee for Rusty for Christmas. It's a win-win. Hey Jack, are you going to sleep all day or are you ready to get started on this part six video? Jack? Oh, you're getting more like Rusty every day. Okay, here's the rear of the cabinet. I haven't done any of the routering yet. I've just sanded it. Um, got the chassis installed here with tape so that I can lay out uh, all my drilling and machining for the controls. The rear panel, which is held uh, by uh, sheet metal screws to the chassis. And then I put in the bottom panel just permanently. It's uh, not going to be removable. Uh, you can look in and see the cleats in here that are holding the uh, speaker baffle and also there's cleats down here that are supporting this lower panel. Here is the speaker baffle. You see that I've left space all the way around uh, so that the uh, material when it comes around the edge of the cabinet and when the grill cloth comes around the edge of the baffle there will be clearance for it. I'm going to space the uh, grill cloth away from the baffle a little bit like uh, Fender does. Got that nice routered hole here for the 12 inch Jensen speaker and in there you can see the cleating for that permanent back door. 
Uh, got the chassis mounted up here in the roof. And you should notice that I have clearance around the upper back door so that it will clear the material that wraps around plus the material that's wrapping around to upholster the door itself. Now let's pull the upper rear panel off and take a look at the chassis and see how it's mounted. Okay, and here's the cabinet with the upper rear panel removed. You can see the chassis attached with these two, two screws here up to the uh, top of the uh, cabinet. I've got tape here so that I can start laying out my positions for controls. Uh, rock solid. I'm not sure if I'll have enough space here. If I don't, then I'm going to cut a little relief right down here. And that way I can put in the uh, foot switch and the cord and other things like that without any concern with bumping my tubes. Okay, here's a dummy C12Q Jensen speaker installed in the baffle with the T-nuts. And as you can see, there is about one and three-eighths inch clearance between the rear of the magnet and the metal chassis. Okay, here's one final look at the cabinet before the routering process. Um, you can see all the square edges and the construction details. Upper rear panel with clearance for the upholstery material. Fixed lower panel. Okay, next time we see this, it will have been routered. Now, for those who are fond of sawdust, nothing makes more of it than a router. Here's the table after the cabinet's been routered, and now let's take a look at the cabinet itself. Okay, well, here's the finished cabinet. Um, you can see the effects of the routering really give it a nice finished appearance. I used each of the construction steps that I described in detail in uh, my previous video on how to construct a finger jointed cabinet. Hopefully you have taken a look at that video. I've also tossed in a few little extras uh, on this specific cabinet. So now we are ready to cover it uh, with some suitable and hopefully attractive uh, vinyl or Tolex material. Now it's time to put away all the woodworking tools and get out the metalworking tools to machine the chassis. I'm going to add the inputs, knobs, uh, toggle switch, fuse uh, on top. We'll mount the transformers on the back and then underneath we're going to mount all the tube sockets and the output jacks. My approach is to tape off a section of the chassis where it's going to be exposed and where our controls will go. Then I draw a center line down the long axis of the tape and then position the nuts uh, for the input jacks, the five knobs, these are stand-ins, I'm waiting on two more knobs, uh, toggle switch, uh, of course pilot light and fuse. And then position them in groupings and with spacing that is uh, pleasing to the eye. Uh, then go back and measure with a ruler just to make sure that you do have precise uh, positioning. And then uh, cross mark where you want your centers. And then we're going to start drilling holes of the right diameter. Then once you've marked all your lateral positions, then uh, write down what diameter hole will have to be drilled at each of these locations. Then dimple each of the drilling centers with a punch and hammer so that uh, the drill bit won't drift around when you start trying to drill. Then I add uh, a one droplet of a drilling lubricant to each of the spots and then drill a 1 8 inch pilot hole at each of those marked centers. Then once all the pilot holes are drilled you can go back and use the proper sized bits to drill holes of the appropriate diameter in each location. Okay and there you have it. Uh, properly sized holes uh, that are nicely spaced. 
Uh, I've tested each of them with whatever's going to fit in the hole and everything fits fine. Also on your fuse, you might want to uh, drill the hole a little bit small, then file sort of a D shape so that the uh, straight part of the D fits here and then your fuse won't be able to spin around, which is sort of annoying. Okay, now it's time to install a power transformer into the rear of the chassis. There are several position uh, considerations, and that is this much is going to protrude out the rear, so be sure it'll clear your speaker, and this much will be, tr be protruding into the chassis, so you have to be sure that it's not going to come in contact with either the fuse holder or the pilot light as they protrude down here inward. So our transformer will be down in this area. Another really overriding consideration is that you want you to keep your power supply as far as possible from your inputs and your preamp tubes. Remember the preamp tubes will be down here, inputs up here, and then as far away as I can get it will be the power supply in here with the filter capacitors. I might even build a partition here to further shield my power supply from my very sensitive input section. Then once you've determined where you're going to position it, uh, I make a paper template that uh, shows the positions of the transformer studs and the cutout that's going to have to be made in the rear of the chassis with a little bit of clearance all the way around. Then I clean the metal surface, uh, apply masking tape, position my template, and then transfer these markings onto the tape to prepare for cutting. I apologize for all the background noise, but the tree pruners are at it again. Um, okay, I've used a drill lubricant, drilled 1 8 inch pilot holes, and then I've drilled larger holes here that will match the radius of curvature of the protrusion here from the power transformer. And then finally I'm going to take a saber saw with a metal cutting blade and cut the square distances in between so that I have a really nice round cornered rectangular hole for this part of the transformer to fit through. Now if you've done everything right, you're going to end up with a really nice smooth hole here uh, for your power transformer. And it'll fit in easily and snugly so you can tighten the nuts inside the chassis to hold it firm. Now it's time to set up the tube side of the chassis. We're going to have our four shielded 12A tubes. We're going to have a pair of RCA outputs for the foot switch a pair for the reverb uh, tank in and out, a pair of speaker outlets uh, for 4 and 8 ohm. This will be the toggle switch for the biasing of the output tube here and then the rectifier here. I'm going to lay a piece of tape out, mark it, and then drill pilot holes just like I did with the controls on top. So now I've clearly marked the centers and the final diameter of every one of the holes that I'm going to drill on the tube side or the bottom of the chassis. Now I'm going to drill pilot holes at each of these points. Now we have our pilot holes drilled and it's time to use step bits to open these holes up to accept tube sockets. Okay, here's the bottom of the chassis with all the tube sockets uh, machined and ready for installation. As you can see here, we've got our uh, 5Y3, our 6V6, or 6L6. This will be the bias switch, depending on which tube is in the socket. These will be the 4 and 8 ohm speaker outputs. Over here, we'll have tremolo foot switch, reverb foot switch. And this will be uh, reverb tank out reverb tank in, and then the four 12A tubes, 12AX7s and 12AT7s, all ready to be riveted in. Okay, Rusty, as specified in your contract, you get your cookie, and now you're going to help me with a video. Okay, now you finished your cookie, 
Are you ready to start on the video? Huh? It almost looks like you are. No, you just want another cookie. You want a cookie? You gonna speak? You gonna speak? You want a cookie? Well, too bad. Your contract says you only get one. Okay, now it's time to install the output transformer and the reverb driver on the rear of the chassis. We make sure that there's clearance with the speaker magnet. Uh, we make sure there's distance between the power transformer and output transformer and that their axes are perpendicular. This will cut down on the interaction between them. There are, of course, location uh, considerations for the output transformer. It should be near the speaker output jacks and the output tube. Also, the reverb transformer should be near the reverb tube and the jacks that communicate with the reverb tank. Then we mark on our tape where we'll be drilling our mounting holes and then the larger holes uh, for the passage of wires into the chassis and we're going to line these holes with rubber grommets. Okay, here's the a reverb transformer hole, output transformer mounting, and the two holes. Okay, time to drill. Now that you've drilled the holes, uh, check the grommets for clearance, make sure they fit in properly, and uh, check the alignment of the holes in the chassis with the holes in the transformer. If everything checks out, then we're ready for the next step. Then the final step is that I'm going to rivet in a line of terminal strips for all the controls, a line of terminal strips down here for all of the tubes and outputs, and a couple others that are perpendicular here for my power supply, filter capacitors, and resistors. Naturally, these are laying down because they're not yet riveted, and I've ordered a bunch of new terminal strips. Uh, these are old used ones, um, just to show you how the new ones will be aligned. So that's it, okay? Uh, with that addition, our chassis will be completed and ready uh, to, for assembly and then wiring which will be covered in part 7 in which we will install all of the parts, the tubes, the jacks and everything else and then we will uh, perform our point-to-point -point wiring to connect everything together and hopefully make it work. Okay, one last look at the chassis before we move on to part 7. We see here the bottom of the chassis that's drilled for the tubes and for the output jacks and the bias switch the rear which is drilled for the three transformers and the top or control panel which is drilled for all of the inputs, potentiometers, uh, pilot light and things of that sort. Okay, uh, I have not yet riveted in the uh, terminal strips but I will do that uh, before part seven. So that's it for part six. I hope you enjoyed it and that you will join me in part seven. I'll see you then. Bye for now.